the three consultant social workers um, that works within the Westmanners Teaching Partnership. Um, just to give you a little bit of um, information about the teaching partnership, some of you might be aware of the teaching partnership, some of you may not be. Um, we're one of 23 accredited teaching partnerships with um, which are funded by the Department of Education. And essentially what we're about is, it's about sort of um, improving the quality of education um, for social work students and also improving social work practice. And the partnership includes um, many local authorities within the region, children's trusts, um, NHS trusts and also higher education institutes. And um, we have a total of 28 partners and we're one of the largest teaching partnerships in the, in the country, so we're quite big. Um, it's very much about bringing practitioners together, senior managers, academics, um, experts by experience to support us really in the work that we do in terms of improving practice um, for social workers out there and also improving social work education. Um, what I'd like to ask people to do is, and I know most of you have probably done it already, if you could um, put yourselves on mute for this session and turn your cameras off just in terms of connection. Um, and um, if you need captions on, you can actually put captions on by actually pressing the three dots at the top of the screen next to your chat. Just to warn you, the captions aren't usually very um, reliable, so they come out with some funny words. But if you do need them, um, please put them on. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to share with you guys is that this session will be recorded. Um, so it can be used as a post um, training resource um, for those that couldn't attend today. Um, so without further ado, um, um, I will pass it over to um, Dr. Clive Diaz and Rachel Vaughan. So over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here. So if we just introduce ourselves uh, briefly, Rachel, do you want to do you want to go first? Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Rachel Vaughan and I work at um, Cascade, which is the Children's Social Care Research and Development Centre at Cardiff University. Um, and I'm the engagement worker there, so primarily um, I lead on our public involvement and our service user involvement work. Thanks, Rachel. And I'm uh, Clive Diaz. I'm um, a researcher at uh, Cascade at Cardiff University. Um, and yeah, I was involved in the study we're, we're going to be um, talking about. I, w I was a social worker for quite a few years prior to that and also worked as, a, as an IRO um, yeah, and, and, and chaired child protection conferences. And it's really good to be here today and, and to talk to the teaching partnership about our, our findings and share the findings. Hopefully you'll, you'll find, it, find it interesting and useful. Should we, um, should we go to the first slide? Yeah, bear with me. Oh, one second. Um, one second, almost. That's okay. So, in just in terms, of, there's no rush. In terms of the uh, the plan for the session, so we're here until um, eleven a.m. If people have got questions, uh, feel free just to take yourselves off mute. I'm going to start today's presentation by giving sort of an overview of what what we did, a bit about the methodology and the perspectives of some of the professionals. Then Rachel's going to do um, a fair bit of the session around, well, all, all of the bits around uh, what young people told us, which was the key part of the study, really, about their experiences of, of, of lockdown and COVID-19. And then um, and then we'll bring together some final sort of recommendations that we came up with out of this study. And uh, and then we'll have a, a chance for further sort of questions and answers. But if you've got any questions or answers or comments as we're going along, then, you know, totally fine. And there's also going to be audio from young people that we interviewed sort of um, throughout Rachel's section, which I think is really, really good to hear their voices. Um, but yeah, if you've got any questions as we're going along, please just, um, you know, just take yourself off mute and say, oh, can I ask this? Any any challenges to our findings that were totally very comfortable to hear that? Um, and just any views. I'm just really interested in, 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 you know, the more we can engage, the better. And we will aim to end our presentation by sort of 9.45, 9.50 at the latest, so that you've got 10 sort of clear minutes for, for questions. Uh, and also we'll give you our contact details if you want to speak to us after or got any queries about the research. OK, so we'll um, so give a, an overview of the research. The idea behind this was that um, 
so we we both work at uh, for Cascade, which is a research centre at Cardiff University. We do a lot of research around uh, the UK in both England and Wales, and also further afield, uh, particularly around uh, children's social work and what works. And particularly, we're involved. We're interested in family perspectives, young people's perspectives, parents' perspectives. We've got a specialist sort of uh, group of, of care leavers we work with called Cascade Voices. And then, and we work very closely with a uh, with a group of young people called Voices uh, Voices, um, uh, who 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 Rachel will talk about later. We we've also got a, uh, we also um, Rachel's developing some work with a group of parents. So that's really exciting because we really want to make sure that we hear within our research what parents and children and families uh, think of the the services they're being offered and, and the research we're doing. So Voices were very involved in, in developing this research project um, and, and worked very closely along, alongside us. They, they, they helped us think about the research questions. They helped us think about um, the questions that we asked young people, the different methods that we, that we used. Um, and they were involved also uh, in, in thinking about the findings that, and, and indeed disseminating the findings and looking at the themes that came out. So they played a, a big role and, and Rachel will talk a bit more about what, what Voices from Care uh, are and, and also uh, Cascade Voices shortly. Um, I'm, I'm also going to, we're also going to talk a bit about the survey findings. So we did surveys um, with professionals. So what we wanted to do is catch professionals perspectives, but also young people's perspectives. And then I was particularly interested in a comparison of the two. So where professionals said they felt things were going well, what did that, was that mirrored by young people's views as well? And, and, and we'll give you the, the findings on that in a, in a bit. And then we'll talk about the conclusions recommendations. And like I said, have, have um, a show a brief film and have a bit of a QA at the end. So if we go to the next slide. OK, so the research questions, what we were trying to find out, important to give the context of when this research was carried out. So we did the field work for this. I'm pretty sure um, Rachel was more involved in the in the field work. I was more involved in the analysing the data and writing out. But I think, Rachel, it was May, sort of between April, May of last year, 2020. Is that right? Oh, I think you're on silent, Rachel, sorry. Hopefully it'll work shortly. I think you're still on mute there. Oh, there we go. There we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think it was a lot of last summer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so this was. This isn't the current lockdown we're talking about now. We're talking about the first lockdown that we had between March 2020 and May ish 2020, and we were particularly interested in finding out um, care experience young people's views of the COVID-19 because there was a generally held expectation apart from anything else that there'd be likely further lockdowns which of course did come uh, did come to pass and we wanted to know what the sort of level of how, how young people had experienced COVID-19 what how it had been for them um, what how they coped with the restrictions of, of COVID-19 and how it affected their health and well-being there's lots of research around how difficult COVID-19 has been you know, for everyone to an extent, but obviously there's certain vulnerable groups who it's affected much worse than others. Um, you know, obviously it hasn't affected wealthy people in the same way as it has affected people who are, who, who you know, living in, in poverty. Um, and it's it's had a, a major disproportionate impact on certain communities. So we wanted to find out more about that. We wanted to find out what sort of support was available to young people it, it, in care and particularly leaving care. Most of the young people we interviewed were, were leaving care, um, care leavers, and what what they felt of the support that was on offer. Because obviously a lot of the the, the support they'd have got in terms of education, college, and also work, and also you know social workers visiting regularly. That a lot of that pretty much stopped uh, overnight when the lockdown came into place on I think it was March twenty third, um, twenty twenty. Um, and we wanted to think about how the yeah how the support they received had changed during COVID. Was there any advantages? You know, big move online meetings, a big move to uh, online visits. How they felt about that was yeah. Was there any advantages? Was there any major disadvantages? Um, and how we could critically how services could improve their responses for young people in 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 if. Um, if there was another lockdown, which of, of course there was. We also wanted to speak to professionals. If we go on to the next slide, Rachel, 
to get their perspectives of the support they're offering. Um, so, you know, what, to what extent they felt um, that their, the support they were giving was helpful or not. And that would provide very important context to the, to the research that we were doing. So we, we, like I said, we consulted with care experienced young people via, via voices. Uh, they were very involved throughout the, throughout the research study. As I said, Rachel will talk about that a bit more. Um, we did interviews and focus groups. So most young people did individual interviews, but we did do one or two focus groups um with with groups sort of two or three young people and also some young people we we, we offered all young people a, a range of different methods to to be involved in the project so one um didn't want to be interviewed or be part of the focus group but they did sort of email interview so we, we gave them some questions and had an did an email interview and that that worked really well for them young people were also offered the opportunity to, to write poems and to draw um you know, make do drawings and be, do artwork, that sort of thing. So, so young people chose a range of different ways, creative ways, of doing diaries, artwork, to to be part of this research project. And you know, we were very flexible, and and, and they engaged with that process uh, really well. So, twenty three sort of social care, social work practitioners responded to the survey, and that was you know that was really helpful, particularly in terms of the context. And then the analysis, we sort of did standard sort of thematic analysis of of the, of the interviews and the, and the survey data, and sort of pulled it together into a report, which we can share at, at the end. And then when we um, and then once we'd done quite a lot of the data analysis, we met with. Um, uh, vo voices from care, a group of care experienced young people went through some of our findings and they were able to say yes that that sort of uh, you know very much is in line with our experiences um, and uh, you know that sort of confirmed the findings I guess so that was that was really positive again about involving care experienced young people throughout the process. So we go to the next slide. So in terms of the survey results, what was interesting was is that generally uh, professionals were very positive about social workers and social care workers were very positive about the support they were offering to young people. Um, one quote was um, said, one, one social worker said, if anything, video calls have allowed more frequent and meaningful contact with our young people. Um, more time because, of course, all the travel had basically stopped. So social workers had more time to, to, to carry out visits. Another social worker said working from home has been positive. It's been practical and productive and allowed more time uh, to carry out visits um, if, if needed and when needed. Um, and, you know, generally, pretty much all the professionals involved were very positive about the support they offered. They felt that they'd done a really good job in supporting young people. And indeed, they did give some very you know, practical examples where they'd supported young people in terms of financial help. They'd um, arranged lots of sort of extra groups, sort of online groups and some really interesting innovative practice around sort of um, quizzes and um, like cookery sessions, sort of online cookery sessions art sessions online, they'd arranged for um, young people to receive sort of uh, packs. Um, um, one, uh, one local authority they talked about sending out survival bags to, to, care, to care experience young people, made up of sort of self-help books and face masks and sort of bath bombs, um, and, and also sending out sort of activity packs, including sort of puzzles uh, and posters. And so lots of activities, so, you know, if you just looked at the surveys from the professionals, you'd think, well, actually, there's some excellent work going on. Um, young people are clearly being supported. It's, well, yeah, that point there, almost more meaningful, more relaxed contact with between the professionals and the young people. There was some acknowledgement um, that there were some concerns, particularly around funding concerns. So a lot of the professionals in the survey meant, or some of them mentioned that the Welsh Government um, hadn't provided any extra funding, really. There was some specialist funding called St David's Day funding that was available, but nothing extra because of the pandemic. And there was some disgruntlement about that. Just to say of the young people we interviewed, I should have said this at the beginning, I think 17 or 18 were based in Wales, local authorities across Wales, and then three or four were based in, in Herefordshire. So we did have some young people uh, from England as well took part in this study, although the professionals were all from, from Wales, I think apart from maybe one. So basically, uh, the, the professionals were very positive, dis uh, apart from this one concern around, you know, funding and that they didn't necessarily have the funding. And this did lead to them acknowledging that they, 
you know, they weren't able always to, although they did try and provide, you know, IT equipment and say extra minutes and, uh, you know, extra ways that young people could access online. There was, you know, they didn't necessarily have the resources or they didn't to give all young people a laptop and all young people internet access and a modern phone. Um, so that that was a bit of a bit of an issue. So I think now we're going to move on to Rachel talking about the, the findings from the young people. Is that OK, Rachel? Yeah, that's great. Great. Um, so if I can start by just kind of expanding on what Clive said um, about our um, involvement of young people in this project. So at Cascade, we run um, a group called Cascade Voices in partnership with Voices from Care Cymru. That's a third sector organisation here in Wales. Um, and these young people are all care experienced. They're primarily care leavers, um, but we give them some uh, training and research methods and they advise us. Um, across most of our, of our research at Cascade. Uh, so for this project, um, they really kind of inspired it to begin with. And then at the end, like Clive mentioned, we took the findings and we had a discussion with them about it. Um, and they kind of, they really agreed with it. They highlighted what they thought was most important. Um, and they added a little bit, which you'll see that's in the report. But what they also did uh, was develop this presentation with us. Uh, so I've got some audio clips in this presentation, which I'm hoping are going to work. Uh, so bear with me. It's a little bit um, clunky when I'm kind of I'm in control of it and trying to present at the same time. Um, and so the the different bits of audio. So some are when we've done this presentation previously, um, and they presented it with us. Uh, so I've got audio clips from that. Uh, so you might hear me talking in them as well. And then there's a few additional clips where um, they've provided additional examples to highlight some of the work. And um, so we'll we'll include those as we go along. And um, so do uh, let me know if you can't hear anything or if it doesn't quite work. Uh, but I think it really adds um, an extra kind of dimension uh, to our findings um, and it kind of really helps bring it along really. Uh, so I'll just start off then by saying that actually the, the experiences from the participants in this study were really quite varied. Um, the, we've got lots of both kind of positive and negative examples that will come up throughout this. So, and we look at kind of mental health and well-being. We look at some um, kind of factors that were both um, provided either additional protection for the young people or really highlighted the risk. And then we look at the support that they received from professionals, whether that's social services or third sector. Um, and there's kind of like a positive and a negative side to that. And then finally, I'll kind of just conclude and bring it all together and highlight a couple of the points that came up from the Cascade Voices group. So to start off with, I really just wanted to talk about the resilience that the young people showed. So there's two quotes on here um, that kind of highlight uh, some of the examples of what young people were doing to keep themselves occupied. This first one here, I've been doing colouring, been doing things that like make me happy. I've been doing a book, writing a book, putting um, putting like my little sister and my little brother photos of them in the book. That's uh, so the sorts of things they were doing. And then the second quote, um, a young person really highlighting how they surprised themselves at how well they managed. So yeah, like especially with having depression, like when I was leaving foster care, I was very depressed and in a very bad way. And then being locked up as such, that's how people see it, isn't it? I thought I would struggle a lot, but my mood hasn't really changed. I've stayed quite stable. Um, so I've got an audio clip here of a young person talking about the sorts of things that she did uh, during that kind of first lockdown uh, where we weren't allowed to leave really um, and how she managed. The things that I do is colouring, I walk my dog, and I love and I love shopping. Yeah, buying little treats for yourself Does that make you feel better. Yeah, it's like the best therapy out there. That I like, I just like sitting in the fields with my dog. Literally, I sit on the grass and I look at the clouds. Now that's like a nice hot day. Did it make a difference having a pet? Yes, because like dog they're proactive like they just want to like go out all the time and it sounds like a hassle for someone if you can't be bothered but it's just like one of those things like having company then oh yeah he just he loves food if you have food he's your best friend he just sits next to you he creeps by the door when you eat it and he comes closer and closer and closer and tries to take he took an apple right out of my hand the other day literally out of my hand as I was eating it. Uh, so that's one of our uh, Cascade Voices members talking about how she managed. Uh, so although um, talking a lot about young people's resilience, 
something that kind of really came out was actually the impact and effect this had on their mental health and well-being. Um, and some of the kind of real general challenges they faced. Uh, so there's a couple of quotes here that kind of really highlight it about someone not leaving their bedroom um, and not going out at all. Uh, but also what we really found was actually all the coping mechanisms that young people would have. So seeing their friends, whether it was work or education they went to, going to the gym, uh, just being out and about, all of that was um, kind of stopped during lockdown and they weren't able to access the things that would normally help them. So it was really difficult. Uh, so the whole experience has been weird. It's just been a massive struggle. So they also um, talked a lot about anxieties for themselves and for their family um, around the virus itself. So that was really quite clean. So um, some of the young people we interviewed has, had physical health issues, which meant that they, had, they were particularly vulnerable if they became ill with COVID-19. And more generally, there were concerns about catching the virus across the kind of co whole cohort. Um, and for those that lived rurally and they needed to kind of catch public transport or needed to use public transport to go shopping, that kind of really highlighted um, where their fears were. Some of the compounding anxieties, so lots of the young people had limited social support networks. So they expressed concerns that no one, no one would know if something happened to them or happened to them because they lived alone and they were really isolated. Um, and really things got a lot worse as time went on. So the longer that the lockdown and the COVID restrictions went on, things were more, more challenging. So at first I didn't really mind it because I could actually finally get some peace and quiet, but then I just got bored. Towards the end, I was literally just in bed all day. I couldn't go out. I'd only go out to do stuff like go to the shops and whatever, shower, that was it. That's what my days consisted of. I was literally asleep most of the day. Uh, so increased mental health difficulties was reflected on by all participants. Young people highlighted the loss of previous routines and contact with others. This coupled with extended periods of confinement in their homes resulted in their mental health difficulties becoming more pronounced. Um, and for a lot of the young people, they they were already isolated, so this really um, kind of made it uh, even worse and really kind of highlighted the suffering of loneliness and disconnect. And so this final quote here, it's more like fatigue, like fatigue as it's going on longer and longer. So um, like Clive mentioned, we offered the opportunity for people to be creative and add in different pieces of work and submit different things to us. Um, and so this is, um, like a, an image that a young person submitted and it uh, kind of really shows a deserted town and when they kind of said this to us they also kind of talked about their anxieties over the virus kind of like looming over their town and with all the emptiness and one of the young people from our Cascade Voices group um, when he saw this he just said that it really highlighted to him how um, how it was so much bigger than just you alone in your home because the streets were empty um, and it's just it's that loneliness on a much bigger level that, that he'd ever experienced before. Um, so kind of just a, a really interesting uh, view from a young person there. So next, we're going to look at some factors. So there's three key factors that we um, drew out of the research that were either um, presented like a, an opportunity for protection for the young people or really highlighted the risks um, that they were at. And the first one is accommodation. Uh, so my one of our young people is going to um, kind of talk through this for us. Yeah, basically, like if they're like, it depends if they're still with their foster care or not really, doesn't it? And like if they're like in supported accommodation or supported lodging with their foster carer, because like if they have more people around them, it's more healthier instead mm -hmm. of like less people it means like they're going to be more sad or depressed and, that. Yeah. and like and i think i think it has more to do with age as well because the older you are the more the more depressed you you feel anyway because life isn't the same and you realize that life is really suckish <laughs> So that was that young person's um, description of uh, how accommodation can have an impact. And so really the young people that we spoke to that were in kind of long term supported housing or were in still in a foster care placement, they really highlighted how important that was and how actually that added a lot. They were still surrounded by people. They had to help kind of on site if they needed it. And that kind of that loneliness and that struggle wasn't the same. Um, but we also spoke to a couple of young people that were not um, in that kind of housing situation 
um, a couple that left care during um, the period um, of COVID-19 and lockdown um, and their experience was really quite difficult. And so I've got two examples um, here of young people with um, uh, slightly more negative experiences. My experience of being in accommodation, uh, I moved just before COVID and when obviously when COVID happened in my emergency accommodation, they stopped me from having visitors. Um, I had to have my temperature checked every day and they wouldn't allow me out. And obviously if I did need to go out, then it'd have to be for a good enough reason. Um, and then obviously there was drugs and alcohol in the premises and also I wasn't getting any sleep. It was taking a hit on my mental health, so I decided to move out. So that young person actually left and I went to live with um, like a friend, so sofa surfing, because uh, that's how difficult they found that particular um, environment. Our experience of accommodation. I went to accommodation, a sported accommodation through COVID and it wasn't the best of experience because there wasn't as much support there to help me understand the environment and how washing machines worked and things like that. I had to be thrown in at the deep end and like find my own way around and like find my own way of doing my shopping. Uh, doing my cooking, keeping in mind I went straight from a foster placement into an accommodation. So my experience in accommodations weren't the best. Um, but uh, just to highlight some of the different experiences, we did hear from some young people that felt that they were supported above and beyond by um, practitioners as they uh, changed um, accommodation during COVID and during lockdown. So it was a real mixed bag. Um, so the second factor is finances. Um, so like Clive already mentioned from the, the survey with professionals, um, some of the young people also highlighted that they'd been given care packages and food parcels and support with access to um, either a laptop or, or some kind of device with data. Um, and that was a massive help and really big support. And they also got some support and um, third sector organisations were involved with this and um, that provided some shopping when they weren't able to get um, food delivery slots, particularly those with um, young families. But others also talked about really struggling, um, similarly those with children, um, but um, with people being home longer, bills were a bit higher. Um, we heard from one lad that um, was on a zero hour contract, but he was working full time, but as soon as he had to quarantine, because um, this is right at the beginning, so I think things may have changed later on, but at the beginning of lockdown, he had to quarantine um, and he didn't get paid for two weeks and he couldn't pay any of his bills and he ended up in debt. Um, and it was, you know, some of these uh, care leavers were in the most precarious situations in terms of um, their employment as well. So they were um, kind of really affected by all of this. Uh, so that last quote, um, you can't cope, no one can cope. If you haven't got enough money, can they? Electric and food. Yeah. Here we go. So um, the final factor then was education. So I've got an audio clip here of a young person who's going to talk us through this factor. Young people's involvement in education had the potential to be both a risk and a protective factor. For example, involvement in education had the potential to provide a valuable focus for young people. Yet despite this, struggles with mental health had the potential to inhibit, inhibit engagement and concentration on studies. I'm going to read two quotes from the slide. The first one from a young person talking about their college course. College was running online, but because of how my mental health has been lately, I haven't been able to concentrate on my college work, which meant I fell really far behind. So I have an essay, which I am supposed to get in by Friday, which has 3000 words in it. But because of how bad my mental health is, I can't do it. So I've emailed to my college and told them just to fail me on the course. The second quote is about a care leaver finishing university. Yeah, I guess we didn't have anything to close it or like plan our future or get any ideas, meet with anyone. We didn't get any of those opportunities. Obviously, a lot of people would have volunteered over the summer or gone on to get more experience. So it's just a bit of a mess, to be honest. A lot of people with placements and stuff, a lot of them got cancelled. A lot of plans got cancelled as well for apprenticeship. 
and stuff got cancelled. A lot of them got turned away as well. Anyway, it's a big mess. The loss of opportunity, opportunities to prepare and plan for the future has the potential to be especially disadvantageous for this group of care leavers. Um, so next, we're talking about the support responses um, that young people talked about from professionals. So this um, covers uh, social workers and social services support, but as well also third sector support. Young people talked a lot about different organisations that they were involved with that helped them. So we heard some really kind of really amazing positive stories um, about responses um, and the types of things that young people did and actually what they really enjoyed. Uh, so I've got um, a clip here of some young people talking about that. Um, we did some virtual quizzes and a virtual sleepover and things like that. Um, and that was good to like help us stay connected with each other. Yeah, that's great. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Emma? I have wellbeing support from um, with Carly and I did independent living skills with Tracy and a guy called Nigel, is it Nigel or something? Something like that. So there, those young people are talking specifically about Voices from Care Cymru and the types of things that they did, but actually that the similar sort of things, that kind of group work, um, quizzes, just kind of one-to-one -one support, just drop in and, and a place to come in and chat like they would do in person, was um, discussed by a lot of young people about a lot of different organisations. And some of these quotes are talking about um, how open and accessible uh, social services was for young people, how they had things on Facebook that they could engage with, um, and it worked really well and actually a lot of young people talked about how it was more relaxed, how it was more informal, how it was quicker and they were having better support during this time and they were really positive about it. Um, there was a real note of caution though from Mary at the bottom here that I'm going to read. Um, yeah, so I got a video call from one of the social workers and she was in a nice house in the garden in the summer top and I'm stuck here in a flat. I just think consider going inside your bedroom. Um, so you can read the, the rest of the quote, but I think just kind of um, as we as everybody came to terms with it kind of working virtually and how that worked, probably just some lessons there to think about um, how we're engaging with young people and some of the obvious inequalities that would be showing. Um, so that's a, a real cautionary tale there from Mary. And then just finally on this slide, um, when we were putting this together, one of the young people from Cascade Voices talked a lot about actually the lasting impact that um, kind of real positive support can have. And so he's going to share a story um, about his experience and, and how it had an impact on him. So yeah, there's a story of my time doing the case system probably about four years ago where <clears throat> I spent two weeks and I didn't, didn't leave my flat. Uh, I was in a really bad place, but my the living care team that was assigned to me was knock my door every single day. They'd leave a, I would never answer, but they'd, they'd leave a note and, and a Mars bar. And, you know, while doing this, it's got me thinking on that again and how impactful those little things are. So just an encouragement to those that are looking at getting into sort of being a, a social worker or whatever, even though you may feel like you're, you're being a nuisance, sometimes, Years down the line, years down the line, those things that might be perceived now as a as being a nuisance, as as the impact to change somebody's life going forward. So sorry, that was quite quiet. So I hope you heard that. So that's just a, a lad talking about um, kind of the real impact it had that a worker turns up every day when he was having a bad day. He didn't engage. He didn't open the door. Um, he didn't talk to them, but they left a Mars bar, and he knew there was somebody there. Um, and I think, I mean, that's how some of the, so our Cascade Voices group, that's how they felt when they read some of this, was actually, um, sometimes it's the little things that can, can have the biggest impact and can make a difference when somebody's struggling. So, yeah. oh, there we go. All uh, right, so um, in, in, the same, in the same vein, so talking about um, support responses from professionals, there were also some negative um, responses from young people. Um, so uh, slightly differently then, so mental health services were non-existent at this time and um, particularly as mental health problems were getting worse, uh, they just felt like they had nobody to speak to and quite a few people talked about trying to get some help 
but not being able to get anywhere, not knowing who to call when you couldn't go to the GP in the same way and you couldn't access the same support as everyone was kind of adjusting to um, this kind of new way of working. Um, others really didn't like having to engage on Facebook. Um, they felt like they shouldn't have to. So um, I think I've skipped ahead to a different quote here, but uh, with a child or care leaver, what child or care leaver wants to have social services on Facebook? Like what child? Um, I found out I was meant to find out from Facebook that my money was being cut. They didn't send a letter. So I'm not going to respond to social services through Facebook and I don't think I should have to. Um, so really highlighting the differences and how actually it's an, kind of an, an individual response needs to be considered for the young people. Um, and a, a quote a bit earlier up, so talking about slipping under the radar, social services with my parents, they decided what I could do, where I could go, where I could stay, when I could get my hair cut, and then to be so not bothered when there's a pandemic on, it makes you feel like, so what? Uh, so certain young people really just didn't feel like they heard any support. We heard from young, some young people that hadn't heard from a support worker at all. I had no way to contact anybody um, and the office was closed and they didn't know who to get in touch with. Um, and they really just felt forgotten. Um, and so finally, so uh, this quote at the bottom, they should be out there like when I needed food, I tried my support worker and nothing. They should be out there delivering food to like uh, your people that you're assigned not telling us to go to volunteers. You are our parent, you should be bringing us food. Uh, so here's a poem um, that a young person uh, sent to us uh, that we felt was, was really powerful and really highlights a lot of the, the points that we've just talked about. Um, so I've got um, an audio, someone reading it. Times have changed, time is passing, but our need for you to care is not lapsing. We may whinge and shout and we say we don't want, but we do, we really want to. We are isolated, changed and really not sure. We need that face, the one we say we dislike. We need those texts that we never reply to. We need that language that you share. The hey, how are you doing? I'm still here. The real language that cares, the language we need, the language which shows us not everything has changed, the language that comforts us like a weird aunt would send, which would make us cringe and smile. A smile which means something hasn't changed, the language you use to show us you care. So I think that's just a, a really great example. And, and going back to the Mars bar story that the young person just told, just how that, I mean, this, this poem is talking about how even if we don't respond to the text, um, even if we're not getting back to you, um, it, it still matters. And actually that's what lets young people know that um, everything is going to be okay and everything's still fine. So just in conclusion then, um, there, there are some real benefits of virtual working, some really good examples, um, but we really need to be thinking about uh, what's best for the individual um, and are making decisions that way. And some of the young people really <laughs> expressed concern about actually if this was so much easier for practitioners um, did that mean they weren't going to go back to face to face in the future? So it's like nothing compared to what it was before. Um, when it was normal, the help was just immaculate, but now it's, you can't do stuff. Staff, staff can't do very much now to what it was. They were just really concerned that um, because some were talking about how much easier it was and there wasn't as much travel, um, that that would now become the norm. Um, and I think it's, it's more down to the individual and what works for the, for the young person. Um, and then just finally, our Cascade Voices group talked a lot about um, not having had a kutch in months. So a kutch is kind of like a Welsh word for a hug, uh, but it's more than that. It's, more, it's like comfort and safety. Um, and they felt like they were really missing out on that, that kind of um, physical in-person contact. Um, so then just finally, young people still need face-to-face -face contact and those who are leaving or have left care should be prioritised by services as they may be living alone and isolated. Um, right. Back over to you, Clive. Sorry, I think I might have gone on a bit longer there. No, no, that's fine, Rich. Thanks a lot. Um, so in terms of recommendations which we uh, made from the report, I think one of the big issues was that the, the funding needs to be available. I mean, we found in Wales, and I think there's been the same issue in England of the sort of digital divide, um, where a lot of young people don't have access to, you know, to decent laptops, to decent smartphones, um, um, 
good internet coverage and where everything moves online and, and the same of course with parents and Mary Baginski carried out a study looking at parents experience of child protection conferences and she found that um, you know they found them even more oppressive even though professionals were quite positive about child protection conferences moving online parents found them really really difficult really hard they're often phoning in they, they you know they're not getting to see people's faces um, those sorts of things and, and really they're not feeling engaged in the process so there's something very important about ensuring that young people have access to decent IT equipment so that they can partake in in a meaningful way in in online meetings um, the other uh, some other important recommendations we found were around um, being clear that the Welsh Government and, and it would be the same for the DfE should be clear about what the minimal requirements were uh, or, or standard requirements of um, of local authorities in terms of their corporate parenting roles. So, the, you know, there sh should be some basic expectations like ensuring, and of course, central government need to fund this, uh, that, that the young people have regular access, uh, sorry, good access to internet, to phones, Obviously, also expectations around um, visiting. You know, personally, this we didn't write this that clearly in in the report, but I think, you know, we know now. This is a year later that it is safe to meet people outside, um, two meter distance. So I think there is something. And 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 to be fair to the social workers, they were in some circumstances where young people were very vulnerable doing this. But I think it needs to be more consistent about doing sort of socially distanced visits and going for walks and doing activities outside um, making sure that you know what we saw in this research was very much a postcode lottery some local authorities were providing lots of support lots of lots of um, lots of you know activities and things to do and also some financial support and other local authorities much less and I'm currently doing a study in the northeast of England uh, looking at children in care councils during COVID and looking at family time contact during COVID and again we're seeing a massive postcode lottery and there's not that much clear national guidance really about these really important things like children and care councils like contact uh, and that does need to be resolved that that's a year later and it still hasn't been resolved definitely not in England anyway um, so the provision of laptops I've already touched upon this data and internet access that has to be a priority um, and we need to you know think about the long-term impact of COVID-19 and the inequality the impact on the job uh, market um, career opportunities training opportunities education opportunities this was a big issue uh, for, for a lot of the young people we interviewed, you know, their courses just stopping, employment opportunities reducing. When we look at the unemployment rates and the increases across the UK over the last sort of year, it's been almost exclusively impacting on, on young people and that's likely to be even more the case when furloughs reduced. So we do really need some, you know, the government uh, talks a good game about levelling up, but it really hasn't done anything meaningful, I, I don't think, um, in England anyway around that. If we go to the next set of recommendations, um, all local authorities need to make it really explicit what they're going to do for young people and, and make sure that young people are aware of that. Um, the, we weren't finding that was the case last spring. Uh, definitely there wasn't clarity around that and involve young people in in, in developing what, what they're going to offer and, 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 and children in care councils can play an important role in that. Uh, tailored individual responses for young people. I mean, a big issue uh, like Rachel has recounted and you'll see in the report was this issue that it was very patchy. Some some young people weren't getting calls, didn't know how to phone because the office was closed. They didn't have mobile numbers. So we really need to make sure that we're getting, you know, consistency uh, of good quality service across the across the board and, and the support and services need to be well publicized so that young people are aware of them and that there needs to be a range uh, for, for, of different means, creative means uh, and, you know, WhatsApp, Facebook, um, Zoom, etc., whatever that suits the particular young person, we need to be creative. And then, uh, and also very important about training, you know, do individual social workers um, feel confident? Are we providing training in virtual methods, technology to social workers? Do they have the right access? Harry Ferguson's uh, done a lot of research around this over the last year. The impact of COVID-19, some local authorities are providing their social workers with smartphones and with good access to WhatsApp and things like that, but some local authorities aren't, and that makes doing digital online visits very, very difficult. So there needs to be, you know, training, increase the confidence levels, um, and 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 thinking about, you know, making sure that workers are regularly communicating with, with, with um, 
with uh, young people. I guess my slight worry that when you look at not just our research, but, but Mary Baginski's research and Harry Ferguson's research is on some level, the move to online meetings seems to work for quite a lot of professionals. You know, they're still incredibly busy, but there's less travel. And I would worry about if that became the norm, even post pandemic, about the impact that that would have on young people, on parents, and their ability to play a meaningful role in decision making. I think it would be further reduced. So we need to be really mindful and, and, and really thinking about that. If we go to the next slide, I think that's I think that's uh, that's the end. Um, so that there's the, the report there, the link to our website. And I think are we going to show the video just before we have a few questions, Rachel? Is that? Yeah, we think yeah. like the audio was quite quiet when we tried it before, but well, yeah, um, I could try putting it on and let me know if you think it's too quiet and I'll yeah. share the link instead. OK, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, I'll give it a go. Okay, um, thanks. That, that's 
OK, so we've got sort of eight or nine minutes for questions or points. I mean, I'd be interested if uh, to hear people's perspectives of how they feel they're doing in terms of creative methods or, or but also, of course, any questions. Um, or any points, yeah, any any examples of good practice would be really uh, interesting to hear. I don't know. Oh, we've got someone with their hand up. That's always a good start. I can't see who you are, but do you want to just take yourself off mute and ask a question? Yeah, um, it's, it's Linus. Um, I'm currently um, employed by the University of Wolverhampton as a practice educator. Oh, great, yeah. So you did, if you asked me um, what are you going to remember from this presentation, it would be the poem. Mm. Because through that poem, I, I have identified something that I'm so passionate about. Um, when, um, you know, the young person mentioned about the language we use and how we use the language mm. to show that we care. That made me remember um, in 2010, I attended the conference, International Federation of Social Workers conference in Hong Kong. And we had different social workers presenting how social work is done in their own countries. And one of the things she said, I still remember and I still use it, and I would like to instill in the students, is that actually social work as a profession in their country is viewed as respected as a doctor, a teacher, very highly respected. And I said, you know, why is that? He says, it's how we use the language, how the language we use. Um, and he said something very simple, which struck me. He said, you see, the very first contact, your telephone, con the very first, you know, when you're trying to introduce yourself to the service user, he said, that is the most critical, important piece of best practice. When you're making that phone call to the client, let them sense in your tone of voice <coughs> and the words you use and how you use it that you actually, you're there to care for them. So I thought this is a powerful poem mm. that earlier on, even, you know, the student needs to sort of we need to have that mindset of uh, being proud of who we are as a profession. And it's not going to just come naturally, but it's how we use um, the language and, and what, what language we use in real life practice. That's what is going to make us really be perceived as helpers, not people who disempowers, but those who are empowering and helping an agent of change. Mm. That, that's yeah. great. Thanks so much for sharing that. And I just wanted to say, actually, in some of the interviews that I did, what I found was that the young people, like you said, that already had that connection with their support worker, whoever that might be, whether it was a social worker or a PA, those that already had that, that bond and that good relationship, it really helped during a difficult time um, in terms of the support they received, but also how how supported they felt because they had that relationship already. Um, and, but those that didn't, then it just it just made it harder. So yeah, yes, yeah, true. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. No worries. That's helpful. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? There's someone else with their hand up. Ellie, Ellie. Exactly, yeah. Um, I just wondered if there were any plans to build on the research, because obviously 23 isn't a very big number. And I just wondered if there were plans to build on it and, you know, put it across the UK. I know that's not, you know, not always possible immediately. Um, but yeah, I just wondered really. And also because of the variety of responses you've got, you know, in so many different areas. So, you know, you talked about some people's mental health and um, some people enjoying the virtual contact, but some people not. Um, is there sort of plans or, or any, any sort of research to look into why those things occurred? I mean, I was really interested in the virtual contact element of it because yes, you know, I think it definitely has helped social workers um but i completely agree that i think you know it does need to go back to face to face and i would much rather see children and foster carers face to face 
Um, but, you know, could there be an element of, you know, perhaps some work being done online, um, you know, and just and just trying to understand, you know, what it is about that virtual contact that makes, um, you know, children uneasy or, you know, feel like they're not getting the service that they used to get. Is that about language or, um, you know, um, communication styles or, you know, it could even just be, you know, a look or a reassuring smile from someone as they come in the room that you're not going to get virtually, you know, all those sorts of things. I'm just, I think the research is really, really interesting. I suppose my mind is just going, oh, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Shall I just say a few things? So the, the sample size of 23 is for qualitative research. That's that's not bad, actually. That's no, pretty I normal. Know, I know. <laughs> you, you get to a point where, you know, you're, you're finding the same data. You get to a sort of saturation point. But I think a, a very important point is what I'd really like to do, and it's finding the, the funding and the time ultimately, is to go back to those young people we interviewed now after the latest lockdown, and, and see how they feel about the, you know, the support they got, um, you know, in the latest, because obviously it's gone on for another nearly year since then. We, we, we were speaking mm. to these young people in the spring, early, early summer. Um, so that would be really interesting. And of course, yeah, some really important questions. Will we, I'm sure there's going to be, there's, there's definitely going to be some continued online work and, and who knows what will happen with this, with this COVID thing. One would hope with the vaccine that will be, you know, the end of it, but we just don't yeah. know, do we? But I think there'll be some online work. And I guess the point I'd make is, I mean, I guess it's, the, you ask a question about um, what is it about online meeting that young people don't get what they would get from a face-to-face -face contact. I guess, I mean, I, I don't think, I'm not sure we explicitly asked that question, but from my own experience, it's very different, you know, meeting a friend for yeah. a coffee. It's all, it's almost amazing now meeting people face-to-face, -face, you know, or going to a GP clinic or, you know, I mean, you couldn't go to the dentist online, could you? It's a, it's a totally different thing, isn't it? And I guess it's the same for young people. They might, there were some young people that liked it in a way, you know, and, and, and did like it. But for a lot of us, we crave, you know, seeing someone in the flesh, don't we? It's a totally yeah. different thing. I mean, I don't know how people feel, but being on online Zoom meetings all day is pretty tiring. And and definitely in the research we've been doing in the north uh, northwest, a lot of young people are saying that you know, and professionals, they're sort of fatigued with the Zoom thing and the Teams thing. You know, they're, they're done with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, what I would say also is that actually the similar research has been done in different areas. So Northern Ireland yeah. um, did a study that was similar. Um, I think it was at Queen's University, Belfast, Bernie yeah. Kelly. Um, and I think, there's, I think there's something ongoing in Scotland at the minute. And I'm sure England have somewhere in England, yeah. uh, there has been something similar done as well. Um, and what we found actually, the, the findings were quite comparable. Uh, presented slightly differently and, and maybe a, a little a little bit different but they were quite similar findings mm. so I think it does uh, yeah so for us it showed that actually what we were finding in Wales was similar in other places mm. yeah um but just saying about the online I mean so I run our Cascade Voices Young People's Group and and actually in one way more young people have been able to join from further afield across Wales but there's also a couple particularly lads I don't know if that has anything to do with uh, gender has anything to do with it, but a particular couple of lads that would always come to Cascade Voices that I have not seen all year. Um, so obviously Voices from Care check in and everybody's fine, but they don't engage in the groups online. So something interesting there. But yeah, I think we're out of time. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for everyone for coming today. That's been um, really good uh, to speak to you about our research and, and um, if you've got any queries, please please get in touch. Our details are, are online. And yeah, hopefully you found that helpful and hopefully we'll we'll see you again at some stage. And thanks a lot for today, Rachel. Thanks, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Bye.